Roughly speaking, we could say that the history of Africa is divided into three huge chunks. Pre-colonial Africa, colonial Africa, and post-colonial Africa. What is pre-colonial Africa? It is not actually Africa untouched by the world. That's not what pre-colonial means. Pre-colonial simply means Africa before it was dominated by other people. So Africa as an autonomous, self-driving, independent continent. Pre-colonial Africa was defined by multiplicity, by multiplicity of cultures, multiplicity of empires, multiplicity of kingdoms, but also a multiplicity of lifestyles. And people often forget to mention this because many people assume that every African was a hunter-gatherer. Not every African was running around with a spear and an arrow shooting game. So lifestyle was also a very important part of the history of pre-colonial Africa. We did not all live in mud huts. We did not all live in thatched huts. There were also multiple types of architectures on the African continent. Now, what happens when the colonizer arrives? The first thing obviously that happens is that those thatched huts go up in flames, which is why many of you probably don't know how an African from a thousand years ago lived because they are simply gone. History has swept them away and they are somewhere out there in the ether, as they used to say. So colonial Africa was about the decimation of the multiplicity of Africa. But most importantly, it was about the introduction of writing. Whereas before, Africans had commemorated their histories in multiple ways, through songs, through legends, through artwork, through sculpture, through painting, murals, um, composing of music, um, the, the bard, as um, the, Afri <laughs> the term is often used, was a central um, invoker of history and chronicler of history. In, cro in colonial Africa, it no longer made any sense to keep singing the songs of the legends when you are no longer free and you are no longer independent and you are no longer autonomous. So the introduction of writing reduced the African continent to simply what is on paper. And there was now a frenzy of writing about Africa. And that writing about Africa is both a gift and a curse. It is a gift because obviously now I can tell you what was happening in Benin in 1895. You can pick a year, 1895, I can look across the African continent and I can find dozens of texts which tell me what was happening in Africa in 1895. Now, why is writing a curse? Paper is destroyable. Paper is flammable. Paper and ink get soaked with water. There are dozens of pictures that I often use in my teaching of children across the world, children from Thailand, children from Africa, children from India, swimming across rivers with backpacks on their hands, on their heads, because they're trying to protect their books from drowning. A book is totally useless when it is wet. So at the most basic level, writing is the most easily destroyed archive of history. It is much more difficult to destroy a human being than to, a human being can be swept down a river and still live. A book, once it goes down the river, it is a dead book in the true sense of the word. You cannot read a wet book. So books actually are not the salvation of African history because they get wet, they get eaten by moths. So this is also one of the biggest reasons why Africans used to tell history to each other. You are alive and for as long as you are alive, you carry the history. A book, once it's eaten by moths, it's gone. The words are gone, they're never gonna come back. So writing is both a gift and a curse. And so the colonial period in Africa was all about getting all of these oral uh, texts written down. So one of my favorite of these texts, for example, is a text from, from, from the Mali Empire. It's about the history of the original Lion King, Keita. The origin of the Keita surname 
in, in Ghana, and it's called the Epic of Sonjara. The Epic of Sonjara is sung with music. It is the entire history of the Mali Empire put into song. And the bard will sing the history and tell you how the original Lion King was born. So almost like watching a Disney movie, but the only difference now is one person is telling you the story. You do not have a whole orchestra playing in the, in the background. So that is the colonial period and the introduction of writing. So what happens then in the post-colonial period? What happens in the post-colonial period is that many of those texts travel around the world and you then start to have people who are ex experts on African history who are actually outside of Africa. So there are now probably more people who are writing about African history outside of Africa than in Africa. What does that mean? That means that one day you will be in Japan and a Japanese person will walk up to you and say, Saubona, Ikamalami Ningu Ashiko. And that person would have learned how to speak Zulu purely from reading an Isi Zulu book. That is what it means to have people outside of Africa who have uh, become experts on African history. So that is the post-colonial period, is this idea that African history became global, African history became available to more and more people outside of Africa. So as Africans, where does that leave us? Number one, it leaves us with three legacies. It leaves us with the legacy of pre-colonial Africa, which most of us still have to understand. It is the most poorly understood phase of Africa, precisely because most people have got just pure fantasies about what they think happened in pre-colonial Africa. And then you have the colonial period, which is actually a painful period. There is a lot of murder, there is a lot of, 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 of enslavement, there, is, there are massacres, and that period brings with it a certain amount of pain, precisely because as Africans we often feel that we lost something. So the, mean, the word loss in Africa is often associated with the colonial period. And then you have the post-colonial period, which one could call the period of recovery. Whereas Africans, we are trying to recover the things that we lost during the colonial period. Now, if you had to ask me, where is this going? So what is the future of African history? I would say the future of African history actually lies in the synthesis of all these three things.